I show you something that will make you feel better? Thank you, all. Frank, you need a project. My program's goal is to improve your health. Put up the scanner, will We look to robots for protection. Imagine the loss of all that we've gained. That thing threw somebody out of a window. Is that right? What's that? Chappie's book? Yeah, it's yours. Chappie's got stories. Chappie's got a book. Miguel Nicolás, Rosalind Picard, Francisco Pico, Gus, Re, Tashi, Mude, Viro, Moshiges, Nida, Kun Paxro, Maje, Jushi, Valamida. Okay, so, like going, we are now going to talk a little bit about uh, the current state of uh, artificial intelligence to try to find out uh, new concepts in the field. So uh, we will start by uh, defining what artificial intelligence means for we three here. So maybe, Rosalind, you can start with your own definition. Sure. When I was a student, I thought AI was about building computers that had mathematical intelligence or verbal intelligence or could pass the Turing test of fooling you into thinking it was a person. Uh, and now I think it's, it's different. I think it's about a computer or a smartphone or any technology that interacts with us, knowing how to do the right thing at the right time and knowing how to do it in a way that doesn't annoy us or that knows how to apologize if it does. So now I think it's much more about social emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Good. Miguel? Well, I'm from the generation of Isaac Asimov and Arthur Clarke, so mm -hmm. uh, artificial intelligence was Hall in 2001 for me when I was growing up. But now I see research on artificial intelligence as optimizing machines to en enhance our reach into the world and, and performing functions you know, that can improve our quality of life, mm -hmm. basically. Great. So, Concerning my own concept, uh, I would think that we have been thinking big for many, many years. And since the 90s, we turn a little bit towards insects, you know, simple intelligence. I think we are still trying to find a way, trying to redefine this. Because even for psychologists, the concept of intelligence is pretty tricky, you know. Uh, many people will say that intelligence is what the IQ test measures, no more than that. So they talk about emotional intelligence, about abstract reasoning and these sort of things, because they really cannot get a simple, unified definition. So I think maybe in the same way engineering is trying to find their way, trying to find something that works, at least. If it is not human intelligence, something that can solve problems in an intelligent way. So this will be our own definitions. Let's move forward to the first question. And this is something that maybe Miguel can deal with. Will machines autom outsmart or replace us? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I have been working for the last two years with a mathematician called Ronald Sicurel from Switzerland, trying to address this very question. We just published a monograph together about that. And our conclusion is that no, uh, machines based on our current digital uh, state of the art will not replace us, will not outsmart us. Uh, for a variety of reasons. They may help us, mm -hmm. and they may do wonders, they may do great things for mankind, as they already do. You know, surgeons take advantage of m digital machines to improve their skills, uh, and other uh, smart systems can help people. But the brain of a human doesn't work in digital logic, and it, mm -hmm. you cannot talk about software and hardware in the brain. The brain computes by the laws of physics, and information in the brain is embedded in the matter, the organic matter that at multiple levels defines the brain. Mm -hmm. So when the brain computes, it computes as a whole mm -hmm. and at different levels. And in that sense, it cannot be reduced to an algorithm. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason we both concluded that mm -hmm. uh, at least on machines that we know based on Turing mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, universal machine, mm -hmm. it's very unlikely that mm -hmm. our brains will be outsmarted by a machine. I see. Great. Uh, so we will have, uh, as a third question, um, what are the biggest challenges for AI? This is something that I might take. Uh, we can see it from different approaches, like the technological, the theoretical approach, and also the cultural approach. So I think the main problem is at the technological level. We want computers to be interactive. We want them to show intelligence, to show complex behavior. But think about it. They are stored in a room. We are all the time walking in the streets, talking to people, experiencing, learning from others. But they, they don't have that chance. Maybe now with the internet, this will change. But in principle, they don't have this contact with the surrounding, with the environment that we have. So maybe the first thing that we have to solve at the technological level is to try to make them more connected, not only to the world, because we are now working on that, providing more and more sensors, but also to talk to people. I mean, we don't talk to computers. We use computers a lot through interfaces that are very simple, or with programmers, people that have very skilled knowledge of how to talk to a computer. How it will be if we could talk to computers in a normal way, if we will have a universal language, not only for all the world, not only for all the humans, but also for machines? I think in that way, computers could learn a lot from us. At the theoretical side, I think the brain is a model that we still have to understand. Definitely, in neuroscience, we need to progress a lot. And it's very difficult, because the brain is made you know, of a soft tissue that is hidden in a box, completely protected. You know, billions of neurons are interacting there at the millisecond scale, trying to synchronize to represent the world. So getting information about the system is in itself a challenge. Understanding those data is even harder. So at the anatomical and at the physiological level, we have to progress a lot to understand our principal model of intelligence. And finally, at the cultural level, I think we should also uh, make some progress. Basically, all the films go in the same direction. Hollywood has this view of robotics and artificial intelligence. They are going to replace us. They are going to fight us. We have to escape from them. Maybe we can go in a different direction and try to go together. So there are definitely challenges also in, the, in this side of, of the problem. So let's move to the next question. How will intelligent devices behave in a 10-year horizon? How will they develop with these intelligent skills that we want to put into them? So maybe mm -hmm. Rosalind can help us. Yeah, I'd like to make a meta remark first, and that is that people often ask these questions as if they think the devices are going to do something without our intervention, and we're just guessing what that will be. Uh, but we have to remember that we who are engineers here are the ones making the decisions as to what they're going to be able to, to do. Mm -hmm. So if we choose to make monolithic, all-powerful devices like, like HAL, and give them control mm -hmm. over the whole spaceship, or give them control over the whole company, uh, or all the airplanes, then if we suffer at their, at their controls, it's because we gave them that capability. Mm -hmm. So I think a very important question is, what do we want intelligent devices to behave like in a 10-year horizon, not just what do we think they will behave like? Mm -hmm. And there I think about what I would like to see. And I don't want to see a monolithic device that, as Marvin Minsky said, will be so smart that we'll be lucky if it keeps us around as a household pet. Uh, I don't want to be a household pet. <laughs> I would like to create the intelligent devices that make our lives better. And there I think of not these monolithic devices, but devices that uh, communicate with each other. Our smartphone communicating with our smartwatch, communicating with our devices in our home, communicating with our friends' devices, letting me know if my sons or my husband are encountering unusual stress, uh, being sensitive to the fact that maybe my sleep was disrupted, 
and some careful presentation of the day's schedule might be more important to me than another software update, especially if I'm rushed to get out to a lot of meetings. That kind of intelligence is ca we're capable of starting to build that. And it's not as easy as it sounds. It's actually quite complicated. Uh, I would say it's much harder than forecasting the weather. Forecasting mood is extremely difficult. Uh, it's going to take uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of data and effort to really build intelligence that can do that. Uh, and yet, if we succeed in that, I think the next 10 years will be very different. I think we'll see technology not being associated with being annoying and increasing stress and people wanting to go off the grid, uh, but technology really um, showing more respect for our feelings and enabling us to live lives with greater well-being. I also think we're at the cusp of a revolution where the intelligence can start to help us determine what is good for our health before we get sick, and what is happening to people when they're on a path that makes them sick, and help us uh, make better decisions before we get sick. I think we could prevent a lot of diseases and even prevent mood disorders, like most of depression, if we uh, take the intelligence and the devices and start to feed them into what brings about greater well-being. Hmm. So that's what I hope we will be making. Uh, mm -hmm. over the 10-year horizon. Thank you. Okay, so let's move to the next question. Does technology make humans more human? So maybe Miguel can help us with, uh, with this question um, in two or three minutes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that is uh, the aim of, I think, most of engineers, scientists that want to improve the quality of life of millions of people living out there is to develop technology that can in, in increase our lifespan or in, increase the, the quality of our lives. Um, we working, for instance, with uh, uh, severely paralyzed patients, we saw that in addition to restoring mobility or restoring cardiovascular function, just because they can walk now or you know, any other uh, systemic function, what we saw from all these patients, it, it was a testimony that they gave us that they felt that they recovered their dignity <laughs> because now they had autonomy, they could do things that they haven't done for a long time. Mm. And I think that for me was very, uh, you know, it opened my mind to the notion that when you create a little bit, you know, a, a heart pacemaker or a new treatment for epilepsy or, or uh, exoskeletal or something like that, mm. and people can do things that they used to take for granted that they cannot do any longer because of disease or trauma. You know, you are using technology as a, I like to say, as an engine of social transformation. Right. You're really trying to make life uh, a little more happier, you know, mm -hmm. a little better for a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. For, uh, you know, we don't, we don't realize it takes a millisecond for you to <laughs> lose the ability to move. Mm -hmm. And a lesion of a couple millimeters in your spinal cord, you it. know, changes your life forever. And so that's the way I see the possibility of technology mm -hmm. Uh, becoming an extension of us mm. to improve uh, the life of many people. Great. So finally, since this is all about curiosity, what will be your greatest curiosity, Rosalind? My greatest curiosity? <laughs> I'm curious about everything. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, as we talk about um, consciousness and mind and meaning, I'm curious where it all comes from. Uh, and, you know, if you think about, you know, a, a theory of everything coming out of random, purposeless, meaningless stuff, it doesn't explain why we're seeking meaning and why we're here trying to understand things. Uh, and, you know, so much of what we do seems to be imbued with purpose and meaning. So I'm really probably ultimately curious about where that comes from. What is the source of all mind and meaning? And I believe that we are fully known, uh, and perhaps someday we will be able to fully know that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Miguel? Well, I'm, uh, the more I, I work as a scientist, you know, after three decades now, I can say that my, the focus of my curiosity is the human condition. You know, mm -hmm. I always marvel about what we humans can do hmm. for, the, for the good and for the worse, but uh, I, 
uh, as you said, I always wonder where it all comes from, you know, because we basically live, and we don't realize that, but we, we have in our heads the, the greatest illusionist of the whole universe. Hmm. It's the only thing that we know in the, you know, the cosmos that is capable of creating reality in a whole theory of the whole universe. So I call that the human universe. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm always marveling about how that all came from when we you know, came from the trees and started walking around. And out mm -hmm. of a sudden, mm -hmm. we decided that we would create the whole universe out of your, our heads. That's right. <laughs> Great. And as for me, definitely genetic expression. I, I think in this century we have this challenge to understand genetic expression, how a full organism with all the richness of cellular types, organs, and behavior can develop from a single cell. So in past centuries, Charles Darwin was trying to uh, find cues on how all the species that we know came from a common ancestor. I think now the challenge is to know how all these cellular types come from a single cell, embryology, basically. So I would really like to see the whole picture of embryology. And in the sense of technology, uh, probably this common language for all machines, all humans, will be a real challenge for us. So I'm very, very, very curious also about how this could develop in the future. So thank you very much for your contribution. Thank Thanks you. for staying here. Um, this is it. Thank you. And yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs>